Thanks for downloading the In Our Time podcast. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello. In Shakespeare's The Merchant of Venice, the young Lorenzo woos his sweetheart with talk of the stars. There's not the smallest orb which thou beholdst, but in his motion like an angel sings, still choiring to the young-eyed cherubims. Such harmony is in immortal souls. This is the music of the spheres, the idea that the stars and planets as they travel through space make beautiful music together. The music of the spheres played out of the ancient classical world through the medieval period and into the Renaissance. It affords us a glimpse into minds for whom the universe is full of meaning, of strange correspondences and grand harmonies. With me to discuss the music of the spheres are Jim Bennett, director of the Museum of the History of Science at the University of Oxford, Peter Forshaw, postdoctoral fellow at Birkbeck University of London, and Angela Voss, director of the Cultural Study of Cosmology and Divination at the University of Kent, Canterbury. Peter Forshaw, the starting point for all this is the Greek philosopher Pythagoras in the 6th century BC, who spotted a relationship between mathematics and music. Can you explain how he is said to have arrived at that? Yeah, um, the story goes that Pythagoras one day was um, wondering how he could discover um, some something useful um, for... Um, we, already something existed, the straight edge existed for the eye. He wanted to uh, discover some sort of instrument that was useful for the ear. Uh, uh, and basically, one he was walking past a blacksmith's shop, um, or a smithy, and he heard the clanging of hammers on the anvil. Um, suddenly he realised, ah, the gods have given me a clue. He went inside listened to the hammers and recognised some con consonants between the sounds. Uh, the story goes that he weighs these hammers and discuss discovers that it's something to do with the weight of the hammer that is responsible for the sound. He goes home uh, and stretches gut strings from a rod, adds weights to the bottom of them, and then plucks these strings and experiments. And through that, it, we are we're led to believe, he discovers the basic consonances of the octave, the uh, perfect fifth and the fourth of music, and the idea, the notion that music has a mathematical foundation to it. And so the idea that music has a mathematical foundation to it is the sum of that, whether he arrived at that by this, this folk myth, which yes, could yeah. be true, uh, yeah, yeah. or whether he didn't, is, is slightly beside the point. Yes, I mean, he yeah. arrived there at that notion. Had it been, uh, had it been hinted at in Babylonia or Egyptian uh, ideas before then? Um, you'd always got a, a mathematical basis to, um, for, ex for example, astronomy and astrology. Mm. And, and these are areas that Pythagoras is tapping into, really, with his work. Because what he does is he extrapolates from the fact that mathematics is a basis for music to the idea that there are underlying harmonies in everything, both the microcosm, man, and the macrocosm. Uh, and particularly takes it from this idea of music um, with ha hammers and anvils to the idea that there is an underlying harmony astronomically and astrologically through the heavens. Yes, as I understand it, it takes the idea of what is discovered in, through mathematically mm. into music, takes him into spheres and yes. takes him back into the way the human soul operates. So he, he has, the, as it were, the whole the whole thing comes out of this mathematical discovery of the, of the correlation. Between. And in doing so, he discovers that the, the diatonic scale, which is the basis yes. of Western music, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, yes, do. Yes, yes. That's right, is it? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, in fact... Um, some of his hist uh, of, of his biographers say he goes from the di uh, diatonic scale to chromatic scales and, and harmonic scales as well. So it develops through the whole tonal series. But um, one of the this most significant things in Pythagorean um, philosophy is this idea of a tetractus, which is um, a triangle of ten dots, one dot at the top to four at the base. And uh, that is the symbol of everything in, in many ways for Pythagoras. For, for a start, one plus two plus three plus four equals ten, which is the perfect number. But also the ratios one to two is the ratio of the octave um, in, in, in the lens of strings. Two to three is the ratio of the perfect fifth, and three to four is the ratio of the perfect fourth. So number becomes, well, number for Pythagoreans is the principle, the source, the root of all things. Can you explain how Pythagoras envisaged the harmoniousness of the universe? 
Um, he has... This is slightly difficult. He has this idea that there is, OK... Uh, um, a set of nested spheres. You've got the Earth at the centre, and then you've got the seven planets of the traditional cosmos, go from from Moon, Mercury, Venus, Sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and then you've got the fixed stars, which is where the zodiac is. And each of these has its own different tonal sequence. Of course, there's also the problem, um, as people who study Copernicus know, that. Um, there's the possibility that actually the Earth is not the only model as the stable Earth at the centre. You've got a fire at the centre and then the Earth and the counter-Earth that Aristotle discusses in his metaphysics to do with Pythagoras. Let's come back to this notion of spheres. I think we're getting there, Jim. We're not yeah. quite where I want to be at this stage, <laughs> but we're getting there. Uh, implicit in this Greek idea, we've got... Let's, let's say it is Pythagoras, and he's yeah. got his mathematics, and he's discovered this musical relationship between um, mathematics and music, and then he takes it out there. Now, he's helped by a, con a coincidental development, as I understand was almost entirely Greek, the development of the idea of the sphere. Is that right? And if that's right, what did that help him? How did that help him? There is a certain coincidence there, but the Pythagoreans also arrived at the conclusion that the Earth itself is a sphere. So if you think of the, the, the geographical Earth as spherical, then it's natural to imagine how the geometry of the heavens relates to this shape. That, that's a, a, a consequential question, if you like. So it's not entirely uh, uh, coincidental. And um, there are two ways of uh, thinking about how the, the heavens come to be uh, spherical. Uh, it, it might be a matter of principle or it might be a matter of practice, let's say. Uh, most, I think, historians of science would probably think it's, well, it's principle. Plato comes along and says, well, the, the sphere is the most perfect geometrical form. So therefore it's suited, uh, uniquely suited to the spherical heavens. Or you might think of it more as a practical matter. That's to say, society is organized often in relation to motions in the heavens. So many of the things that we do and organize in civic society and religious society depend on motions that we observe. Uh, so the motion agriculture of the sun, does. Yeah. Exactly. The agricultural yeah. year, the seasonal year, depends on the position of the sun in the heavens, in the heavenly sphere and so on. So we begin to observe that and regulate our lives in relation to that. And we might even begin to measure it. And if we start to measure it, then we think about an arc of motion. And as we measure the, the, the motion along this arc, and the arcs might be the, uh, the motion of the sun, the circle that the sun makes in the, at the equinox, the, the equator. It might be the Tropic of Cancer, the, the circle that the sun makes in the day during the uh, summer solstice and so on. And then we think particularly about the ecliptic. Peter mentioned the, the, the zodiacal uh, signs. So the, the, the circle, in other words, that the sun makes in its annual pa path through the celestial sphere. And uh, astronomers r rationalize those, that system of circles into, in fact, into an instrument that they call the armillary sphere. So there are a set of circles that are made in brass. And in, in, in Renaissance paintings and medieval paintings, if you want to say someone's an astronomer, you give them an armillary sphere to hold, which is a sphere made of circles. And that can be rationalized then into a single sphere. And in this in practice story, it seems to me more plausible, <laughs> frankly, the philosopher comes along later on and with a sort of after the fact, rationalization of the sphere being the perfect geometrical form suited to the heavens. But however we get there, whether it's in principle or in practice, the celestial sphere, the idea that the, the, the heavenly bodies that we see at night are all on a single sphere and we sit at the centre of that mm. is mm. absolutely fundamental to traditional astronomy. Yeah. And the clusters of crystal around what we would call the planets are, are, are supposedly perhaps the thing which makes the sound as they move and each, each at cluster you you're, you're half nodding, so if I'm wrong, <laughs> exactly. please put me right. It, it, it makes a sound, and these sounds add up to the diatonic scale. Um, I'm not so sure about that, but from, a, from an astronomical point of view, of course, the, the, the story that I told you about a single sphere isn't going to do the business mm. because it isn't that the, 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 most, the great majority of objects in the sky are indeed all moving around together, but there are these funny things that aren't behaving themselves sensibly and properly and regularly. The fixed stars are all keeping the, the, the same orientation with respect to each other as they turn around once a day. But these other things, these wandering stars or planets, and in this system the moon's one of those and the sun's one of those, as well as Mercury and Venus and, and Saturn and so on, they take, partake of this motion once a day, but they're also moving in this counter motion uh, N not from east to west, but west to east. And, and on top of that, they have these funny idiosyncrasies. That, mm. So you need more spheres in order to cope with... with uh, Eudoxus said there were 27, didn't Well, Eudoxus has a, yeah. an interesting system where he has 
uh, usually four spheres for each planet. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And how that adds up depends on how you you, you count them. But essentially, he has a very flexible system where the spheres that are associated with individual planets turn at different speeds and in different orientations and so on. Angela Voss, yeah, I want it to be a simple at this moment. Uh, So, Angela Voss, will you nail... For the listeners who have had a lot of information, which they yeah. have patiently listened to, all of which they've enjoyed because of its erudition, will you say what the, what Pythagoras knows what thought the music of the spheres was? How was it produced? Okay. Well, I think there are, there are two strands here. First of all, is, is the mystical visionary strand. I mean, Pythagoras was obviously a mystic of some sort. He was a visionary. He had a kind of experience in which he heard, in some inner way, this music. And in fact, he was he believed that he was the only one who heard it. Um, and then he had to convey it to his disciples through earthly music, which couldn't really get quite get there. But where's it coming from? Um, well, this is a very good question, and I think we have to. This is one of the big questions to ask: is you know how we differentiate between theoretical measurements of planets and velocities and movements. I'm going to be quite hearing. simple on this. We talk. We are using the phrase "the music of the spheres" to discuss. That's the, that. That's the catch-all hole. Or mm. things. I still think we haven't actually said to people, "Where is this music coming from?" Okay. Mm. Well, I think it's coming from two places. Right. I th- and I think to, l- to look at that, we have to look back to the Platonic well, tradition. Coming from. Yes, I think there's there's a kind of perhaps more spiritual mode of understanding it, and then there's a scientific mathematical mode. But um, coming up through Plato, we find the Pythagorean ideas presented quite poetically. Uh, and um, in Plato's dialogues, whenever he wants to express some kind of metaphysical truth, he'll usually do it through a poetic image, a narrative of some sort. So when he talks about the music of the spheres, we are given this beautiful story and image of the cosmos singing, which takes us straight to the heart of the imaginal cosmos, the, ima- the cosmos of the imagination. And uh, the story which I will I will briefly tell of the myth of air really gives us uh, the, the idea that, yes. that um, yeah. only when the soul leaves its body can it really hear this music, the true music. Um, so shall I tell the myth of air? Uh, no, briefly, I think we, we, we just uh, he, okay. he explained it in the myth about hearing the sirens yes, singing that on the planet. Yes, someone after the, death. Each siren had a single note, and that, uh, each had different notes, and they together That's they made right. the diatonic scale. Yes, so the right. uh, the planets are actually represented by beautiful women, seductresses who sing this beautiful music and make up a scale, which in Greek is called harmony, but not harmony as we know it. Harmony is fitting notes together in a scale to make up a, a So we're, we're, we're where we are. No, I'd just like to answer one more question, unless you want to sort of well, clarify this even I just wanted to say that I think part of your frustration is that this notion of harmony is more general than music. So it, it, it feeds yeah, into yeah. astronomy yeah. in the sense that there is a, a system, there's a, there's a structure, there's, it is a cosmos, it's, it, things are related to each other. So the, the harmony isn't necessarily, in, in every sphere of its appearance, uh, musical. It can be something to do with relationship mm. and and, and a co- coherence and, and design and so on. So the astronomers tend to use it in that more uh, metaphorical sense. We're yeah, looking yeah. for design and structure and relationship and harmony, but it isn't necessarily something you can listen to. Mm. No, that's what I wanted to ask you next, Andrew. Who, who, you, who is listening to this? So we've had this myth in, in, in Plato. Uh, he, he, this man is resurrected. Uh, the Pamphylian is resurrected. He said, I've been to another life. I've seen the planets. I've seen the sirens on the planets. Each one has a different note, and that's what the music comes from. But he's heard it because he's been dead and come alive again. Nobody else can hear is save Pythagoras. So what did they do about that? And yet people are talking about it and saying it is there. Yes, and there are various theories about why other people can't hear it. Um, uh, Some theories are that it's so loud that it's just beyond our capability of hearing. Other theories are that it's actually been in our ears since birth, so we're so familiar with it we can't actually differentiate it. Um... (laughs) But, well, yes, I think that that there really is a a, a sort of hidden dimension to this music which is perceived by the mind, as you two were saying, and then the audible version of it starts to get a bit hazy. How do you actually hear it? Do you actually hear a planet moving around and creating some kind of a note? Do you actually create notes on musical instruments which will somehow correspond to these planets? And here we have, like, a symbolic... A metaphorical way of listening to it, which I think is the way that musicians began began to work with this. Well, I think so. We, we've sort of got some grasp of the Pythagoras and Plato. How did Ptolemy take this on, Peter Forshaw? Um, how did Ptolemy take it on? Yep, that's um, a question. Second century AD, Alexander. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, Ptolemy, um, I, well, I'll leave the more technical bits, I have to say, in a cowardly way to Jim um, uh, in Ptolemy's harmonics. But in book three, he takes it on in an interesting way that he, 
uses harmony as a metaphor um, for various psychic states. So, first of all, he's introduced the very much the astro astronomy, which I hope Jim is going to go to today. But, but um, on, on the uh, more metaphorical level, he, for example, equates um, the harmony as existence in the macrocosm, in, in the, the greater universe, with the microcosm man. Uh, one, for example, he has a harmony of the power of thought, where just as you've got seven planets, so you have seven states of thought, which are, uh, well, for example, um, e imagination, understanding, reflection, um, and meditation, opinion, reason, and then knowledge, for example. And, and, and he draws parallels between these. He has another set of seven for reason specifically, and so on and so forth. So there you, you, you've got this idea that here you've got a, a, a hard science astronomer on one level, but he's also incorporating the, the more religious tones to it, which is very much part of Pythagoreanism. You can't separate Pythagoras as, as natural philosopher from, from him as metaphysician. Angela? Yes, I think one thing we need to point out is that for these early thinkers, mm. science and religion were not separate. No. The, the spiritual perception of the archetypal perception, if you like, of the cosmos was the scientific one. They mm. were, and it's only since the Enlightenment that these two things have become separated into different strands. Can you take us into the Ptolemaic world? Yes. Uh, as Peter says, T Ptolemy is a man of different levels and different interests and so on, and he doesn't necessarily bring them all together into a coherent whole. And the Ptolemy that I work with, so to speak, as a historian of astronomy, is much more a prag of a pragmatist. Mm -hmm. And he is a problem for this idea of harmony in the, in the heavens for the, for the astronomers because what he wants to do is to produce a system that will predict, because he's, he's an astrologer as well, he needs to really know where the planets are and where they have been and where they are going to be. So he needs a system that works. And frankly, that Eudoxan spheres, that's all very well uh, to sit around and think about, but it isn't going to really help you if you want to know where the planets are going to be. You need a much more flexible system, and you need a fudge. Ptolemy is quite prepared to fudge all this harmony and, and, and structure and so In on. In order to get the stars, movement of the stars accurate. Exactly. Yeah. So he, has, he moves away from spheres, frankly, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. and he moves to circles, because they're much more flexible. And he has, he has circles, uh, planets turning around on circles, and then he has little circles on top of those circles which themselves turn, little epicycles which produce even more complicated motions and worst of all he has the circles not turning uniformly. He has this dreadful thing called the equant point, and I won't labour it, but essentially the, 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 the planetary circle is turning about a point which isn't uniformly about a point which isn't at the centre of the circle, which is a geometrical device for making it turn non-uniformly. And that is unharmonious in the platonic sense uh, but it, it's required as a, as a pragmatic astronomer to get the planets, the, the, your predictive uh, vehicle, to, to tell you when, where the planets are and to do that accurately. So, so Ptolemy's a pragmatist. He works in practice in, in his uh, mathematical astronomy. And frankly, he presents a number of problems to the, the people who are looking for ultimate design in the, in the cosmos. Because he complicates it in, be, simply because of his observation, not simply, because of his observations, yeah. and because he was looking for a different sort of accuracy. Exactly. Yes. Angela Voss, um, I'm sorry to move on, but we are moving on. Uh, it, Boethius in the 6th century, he, he brought it back to music, didn't he, and talked about the three um, different divisions in music. That That's right, yes. This way. Boethius was the um, chief transmitter of Pythagorean harmonic theory to the West in Latin, and his, his treatise on music was influential for the next thousand years, in fact. Mm. Um, and he is a music theorist. He's much more interested in the actual kind of theoretical a harmonic appreciation, intellectual understanding of these ratios and instrumental music, and he divided music into three types, musica instrumentalis, musica humana, and musica mundana, the music of instruments and voices, music of the human being, and the music of the spheres, um, following Pythagoras, who, who did this too. And... Um, Yes, the, the early medieval and medieval theorists were much more interested in real music being the intellectually appreciative music. So uh, to actually play an instrument was the kind of lowest of the low, in a way. And this, this changed in the mm. Renaissance, and we had you know, music coming back as it being more important. Um, so, yes, music instrumentalis, the sounds of music, the sounds of voices, musica humana, how the soul mingled with the body, how you deal with humours, psychological temperaments, how you balance the body in the platonic sense, how you straighten it out after its turbulence of being incarnated, that's all musica humana. And then musica mundana, the perfect model, how you can actually bring that human music into alignment with the perfect model. So it does become like a sort of three-tiered system of working. I think one of the reasons that my questions might seem a bit crude, and I accept that, is because perhaps I'm going for the wrong sort of thing in the sense that we're looking... 
brought up in ages of specialisation, increasing specialisation. Mm. I'm not taking account of the fact that at that time things were not mixed up, but they were they were the part of a whole, weren't they? Yes, You're talking yeah, about yeah. music, mathematics, mathematics, yes, spirituality, yeah, yeah. and so they, the, the, as you said earlier, the, they, they don't think in terms of divisions. If you said no, one thing, no. or they, they wouldn't, people then would not know what you were talking about. Right? Can you develop that, Peter? Ooh, uh, yes. Um, one thing I, I should say with Boethius is that he also transmits a lot of the received law. For example, you, you get uh, with Boethius and, there, and then people who are uh, uh, later in the uh, Middle Ages, they pass on, for example, the ideas of um, uh, Cicero, who also wrote A Republic, influenced by Plato. Uh, and again, in that has a, um, the a Dream of Scipio at the end of it, where he's... Uh, Scipio has a dream. He again ha hears about the music of the spheres. Um, and um, there, just sort of returning to this audibility, he, for example, is one of the people who sa mentions that he can hear it. He says, what is this agreeable sound that I can hear? Um, so there we get a sort of concrete instance of someone who's suggesting that you can hear uh, the music. And actually, um, it made me think when Jim was talking about Ptolemy, a, a contemporary um, of Ptolemy, Nicomachus, who wrote a manual of harmonics, talks about the whistling of the planets in the spheres, even if it sounds a bit like Steamboat Willie and Mickey Mouse to me uh, there. But, but nevertheless, um, the sen this splits that you've got people who are actually suggesting that there are real musical consonances. I mean, Boethius talks about this. He has musical tones uh, assigned to each of I them. I was going to say that, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, but then also you get these arguments of um, which is the high note, which is the low note we haven't touched on. Is, and, and this taps into... Well, where does that come to well, move over to Jim from? The high note and the long <laughs> note? The high note and the low note, though. Mm. This is where different, you don't talk about that. Well, it, it, in, in astronomy that doesn't really uh, figure. So it doesn't. But, but uh, what I did want to say about your idea of, of, of coherence in, in, in learning mm. is that it's due to Boethius that we have this, this, uh, re this division of mathematics into arithmetic, uh, geometry, astronomy, and uh, music. music yeah. and, and that. Uh, becomes part of many people's lives by being taken up in the medieval uh, university curriculum, so that so that th th those those four aspects that that we might think would be quite separate, in fact, are are, are part of the uh, quadrivium course that you do after the trivium in in the medieval university syllabus. So the idea that music and geometry and astronomy are related to each other through this ov overarching idea of harmony and structure and design are just part of the educated person's uh, uh, take on things. When you tell us, I interrupted you. I, I, was, okay, I thought I was, Jim wanted to add something. Remember winded. what I thought. You, you're going to tell us about the different sounds. Okay, that's because I, I was yeah. being long winded. Basically, um, the, the the question of, for example, which um, where is the high note, where is the low note? I mean, Cicero, for example, um, suggests that the high note is the fixed stars, the 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 sphere the furthest away from the Earth, and that the low note is the Moon. And he says because the fixed stars must be to get back to their the same place the following day, they must be moving at a hell of a rate, and because they're moving at a very high speed around the a Earth, high, we're still high, talking about yes, around the Earth. It's yeah. a geocentric perspective, so it must be a high note. Um, Others have exactly the opposite of that. I mean, uh, John um, Scotus Ariogena says exactly the opposite. He said the outer spheres, because they're farther away, are the low notes, and the moon is the high note. Um, and this gets taken up by, for example, people like Agrippa in the 16th century. I'm leaping a bit here. Well, I don't want you to leap yet. Be OK. Just finish Agrippa, and I want to go back a bit. Um, because uh, of he, he talks about harmony in his, his books on occult philosophy, where he equates... Um, different qualities to the planets uh, which are associated with their tones. For example, Saturn is slow and morose, whereas something like Jupiter, is, is, which is slightly f closer to Earth, is, is more stately and so forth. The sun is quite majestic in its tones and has, has a sweeter tone. Uh, and, and so musical tone and quality that affects human life astrologically are, are s related conceptually. Angela, this wonderful uh, 
thing called the Islamic School of Musical and Astrological Therapy. Um, <laughs> we, we, can't, uh, we can't pass it by, although okay. it's not part of our, the main story we're telling this morning, but we have to touch on it, because as in many, many, many areas, the, let's call them the Arabic scholars, mm. took up the running. Yes, for yes. Or years. Well, in fact, the Arabic scholars um, took the Neoplatonic and Hermetic traditions of these, these symbolic correspondences, mm. the Pythagorean, working with them in some way, therapeutic way, took them, and they were really like the stepping stone between the Alexandrian Hermeticists and the Renaissance. So, um, yes, they, they actually devised all sorts of, of methods of, of, of bringing together medicine, music, astrology, um, healing, um, herbal medicine, all these things. Um, and these texts were then gradually translated in, in, the, in the Middle Ages and brought through into the Renaissance and informed the, the hodgepodge, the melee of, of, of texts, avail traditions available in the Renaissance. So, yes, they're, they're very important in that respect. As a, Jim, Jim Bennett, as a historian of astronomy, do you find any value? I mean, they're obviously of intellectual importance. And we're always talking about brilliant people who, with the... Uh, available instruments, literally, mm -hmm, yes, mm -hmm. and the available store of knowledge. We're making magnificent, often imaginative guesses, but sometimes wonderful, and sometimes they come back to haunt us because yes. they're so plausible. So that's not... They're ignorant, and we're not far from it. But do you, what do you find of these attempts to, to bring the cosmos together in musical terms? What do you, what do you, what do you think of them, sorry, these attempts? <clears throat> well, in, in astronomy, I don't think they have an... Until we get to Kepler, and I know we're, that's, that's later in the programmes, so that's further down the line, but unt until Kepler, I don't think the, the idea of musical notation actually gets cashed out into hard astronomy. Mm. But there is that, that more general notion of harmony and relationship. I mean, if, if, we're, if I'm allowed to talk about Copernicus at sure. this stage, for instance, Copernicus is one of those uh, astronomers who are deeply unhappy, deeply unhappy about, about Ptolemy. He says that... Ptolemy is like a, a sculptor who's taken a, 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 a head from, uh, from one model and an arm from another and a leg from some, mm -hmm. someone else and ends up making a monster. Mm -hmm. so, so for him, Ptolemaic astronomy is, is a monstrous creation because there's no harmony, there's no relationship in it. And what he wants to do is to get back to that platonic idea of relationship, cosmos, unity and harmony. So again, it's the metaphorical sense of of a, a musical uh, informing of the of the cosmos, rather than a, a, a direct uh, use of musical notations. I think if we're talking one thing, if we're talking about astronomy, you can't divorce it from astrology uh, in the Middle Ages. Um, one thing we have uh, that Angela touched on really, astrology is used by f physicians who are healing, uh, and really the the link with the music of, of music anyway, and music of the spheres tangentially is goes right back to Pythagoras. Uh, I mean, the story, one of the stories there is that he he comes across a youth, a Taormenian youth, who's drunk, who's jealous of girlfriend, who's in the house of, of someone else, is threatening to burn down the house. And he's been uh, inflamed by hearing a Phrygian melody, a, a, a tune in a Phrygian mode. And uh, um, Pythagoras suggests play, play a different modal tune related to a different planetary sphere um, and that will calm him down and lo and behold it does calm him down so, so that brings in this idea of musical spheres as having beneficial qualities for calming the human soul in a way, and, and medical ramifications. In the 15th century Angela Voss, this became increasingly complicated I mean the eight uh, modes or scales of medieval church music, for instance. Can you develop that a little? Yes. Well, what happened in the Renaissance was that we, we began to have the, the practising sort of philosopher magi who um, wanted to find a way in which he could actually re he or she could recreate the, the the music of the spheres in some way for healing in true Pythagorean fashion. And um, uh, theorists began to find that just having single notes for planets or single pitches mm -hmm. or this theoretical um, uh, advice that they had from treatises wasn't enough. How could you compose a piece of music that would actually have an effect? So mm -hmm. they, um, in 1484, for example, Ramos de Pereja, who was the first one to do this, devised a system whereby each planet related to a musical mode, mm -hmm. and these were actually the eight medieval church modes given Greek names, so it's a sort of mishmash of, of traditions here. Um, and if you think of the white notes on a piano... Um, without playing any accidentals. You know, you've got seven different scales with different combinations of tones and semitones. And these different combinations were found to have very subtle effects, different effects. We now just have major and minor as our two modes, and we all know they have different effects, sad and happy. Well, imagine mm. having seven of those, all with different effects. So we've lost quite a lot, though. We have lost a tremendous amount with, with our... our um, uh, Can you music, give yes. listeners some idea of the, the modes we have lost? 
Because we always think we've advanced, okay. don't we? Well, we seem to have lost quite a lot here. Well, um, what we have basically is the mode on C and the mode on A, the, the major scale on C and the mode on A, but all the other ones too. So, for example, the mode on B, which would be the hyperphrygian mode, mm. according to the 15th century theorists, um, has a very strange sound because you have a, um, um, a diminished fifth between B and F. You don't have a perfect fifth. And they associated that with the planet Mercury, which is very interesting, a sort of very mercurial, sort of otherworldly kind of feel to it. And similarly, the other modes, the Dorian mode on D, does have a very stately, grand feeling to it. And they took this up in the Renaissance, and um, uh, Marsilio Ficino, you know, who, who was obviously working with this system, developed a very complex um, and interesting astrological kind of music therapy in which he would use the modes to relate to the different planets in order to influence, bring influence to somebody. Marsilio Mar Ficino is an extraordinary man, extraordinary translator, mm. polymath, a uh, musician himself uh, in the church, of course. Um, in, in Florence, uh, late, late 15th century, what did he bring to this, this discussion, which is about to go through to Copernicus and change its basic nature, to this discussion of music and, mm. and, and mm. the stars and the influences and the in, interconnections? And we're still talking of an era of massive interconnectedness, mm. aren't we? Yeah, people yeah. are not allowing not even seeing distinctions. What well, did Ficino bring? Ficino is really important because he is the person who translates Plato and brings Platonic ideas to the West. So, for example, uh, the Republic and the myth of Ur is, is one example of that. He also translates a lot of the Neoplatonists who are passing on these ideas about Pythagoras. Uh, Iamblichus, for example, who talks... I mean, he's one of the people who writes a biography of Pythagoras. Um, it, Plato translates here, and, and where Iamblichus specifically states... Pythagoras extends his hears and hears the sublime harmonies of, of the heavens. Um, but also, um, Ficino himself, he's an astrologer, he's a musician, he, he's a music therapist in very many ways. Um, he's influenced by people like the Arab uh, astronomer Al-Kindi and brings in his ideas of radiation, either sound radiations or planetary radiations, and, and makes concordances between them. What was Ficino's theory for the idea that music... Um, had power to move the mind. Do you want to say that, Angela? Yeah. Um, well, he bases his, his music therapy on um, a Neoplatonic framework. He says that this is, this is Plotinus, and one of the things he stresses is that this is natural magic. This is all about connecting with natural forces in the cosmos. So we must remember that he was a Christian as well, and this, this kind of pagan magic didn't sit easily with, with, with some of the Christian you know, condemnations of such practices. Neoplatonism was quite near Christianity in many ways. Yes, there are many yeah. ways in which it did overlap, but when you're talking about invoking planetary daemons, you know, you work, it, it begins to get into dicey territory and creating talismans and things like that. Mm. Um, so he bases it on Plotinus, and the theory is that um, the world's soul, which sort of informs the whole creation, sows baits in the world from the divine mind. And these baits can be images, music, plants, colours, anything to do with natural creation. So if you're working with them, you're actually finding a way to tap in through the soul to the divine mind. Mm. So in working with music, which he felt was the most powerful way of doing this, you're actually connecting with a music spirit, which will tap in directly to the world soul and then directly to the divine mind. So the planet is just an archetype. It's not a physical mm. planet. Mm. It's an archetypal property, mm. which is being a pattern, if you like, which is being activated as a symbol, as a metaphor, to enable someone to go through to something deeper. And that's what he experienced the music doing for himself, his friends, or... You know. Whatever. I mean, he's influenced by the Orphic hymns as well. And the, only, this, the sentence says that but you can attune yourself to different levels of, of, of the universe. Each sphere, each planetary sphere, relates to a different part of the psyche. Uh, you know, the intellect, for example, or, or the intuition, whatever. And the musician, in theory, the practising musician, and Ficino was one, was trying to attune himself and other people to these different levels. That's... Jim Bell, uh, in, in, in 1543, Copernicus published On the Revolution of the Heavenly Spheres. And in a way, mm -hmm. this is a revolution of 1500, about 2,000 years on yes. from Pythagoras, where what mm -hmm. we have been talking about yeah. and what you've been so generously trying to put into a court, into a symbol of all that was going on, because yeah. there's mystical, there's magical, there's, there's mathematical, there's all this... Uh, becomes something different, something that we in the West now would recognise, ah, that's the world we now inhabit. Right. Can you mm. tell us uh, um, what would we know? Go over what he did and say how that changed matters. Well, 
Copernicus is certainly influenced by the kind of things we've just been hearing. Mm -hmm. He's certainly influenced by Platonic thought. He he spends time in Italy, and 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 he and when, but when he goes back to to the, uh, the the colder northern regions where he has to live and make his living. <laughs> Reality is harder. His, 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 his life as an astronomer is tougher. He has to make these aspirations uh, work in relation to astronomical, serious astronomical work and, and, and empirical astronomical work. In other words, he has to cope with that old Ptolemaic problem of this is all very well, but how do we make it work in relation to the motions that we observe in the heavens? Um, but he's nonetheless very strongly influenced. And, and, and as, as we know, his, his principal uh, idea for a solution there is to move the Earth from the centre of the cosmos, make it a planet, pl replace it with the Sun, and putting the Earth out among the planets gives him the possibility of explaining a number of Ptolemaic problems uh, in, a, in a more rational way. The, the retrograde motions of the planets and so on fa fall out much more uh, rationally uh, from his system. He can get rid of that non-uniform motion, that equant point. Mm -hmm. uh, he can get rid of that. But what he's particularly pleased about, and this works well in relation to the, the, the spheres and, and the idea of harmony, is that in Ptolemy, you can't calculate the distances of the planets. You can't mm -hmm. even put them in an, in an order that you, can, that you can be sure about. You put them in an arbitrary order. But once you have the Earth as a planet, you can calculate, by observation and calculation, the relative distances of all the planetary spheres. And what you find when you do that? Absolutely delighted Copernicus. Because what he finds is that the uh, inner, innermost spheres are moving uh, more quickly, and as you go out, they're mo and their speeds, mm. this is not just the period, the speed mm. is, is less. So they go slower and slower until you get to the fixed stars, which are stationary. Mm. And at that point, it's almost an exclamation. There, he says, you have the, the harmony of the, of the cosmos. That's where it lies. And he, he thought he was the, the first person to see this uh, and, to, and to imbue that notion of harmonic relationship and cash it out into astronomical terms. So in a way, although he radically changed what Pythagoras had thought to be the case and what Plato thought to be the case and Cicero and Ficino, and yeah. though radically changed, he came to a conclusion which would have not dissatisfied Pythagoras' exactly. idea of celestial harmony. That was, mm. the, that was the motivation yeah. and that's what gave him most pleasure, I think, in finally nailing down that notion of harmony in the cosmos and making it work astronomically. Mm. Peter? I, I was going to say, I mean, some of this resonates with Pliny the Elder, who, whose natural, philosophy, natural history goes back to, what, the first, second century AD, where he talks about the distances of the planets from each other. I mean, he's, he says, for example, from, from the Earth to the Moon is 126,000 states, doesn't he? Uh, Italian miles. As, so, so, but nevertheless, Copernicus puts it on a far more mathematical basis. Did Kepler, Peter, did Kepler, he was a devo devotee of Copernicus, mm. uh, the German astronomer, Johannes Kepler, did, and he's famous for the three laws of planetary motion, um, but he also was holding on, although they were, like Copernicus, he was, they were changing things radically. He was only holding mm. on, or wanting to hold on, to the idea of the musical nature of the cosmos. Can you explain how his notions of planetary motion kept the idea of musical harmony in, uh, alive? Yeah, again, um, holding on. He was, he, was, he was a natural philosopher, he was an astronomer. Uh, he was also incredibly devout. So for him, you know, observation of the heavens is observation of God's work and God's harmony at work. And really, he was looking for mathematical proofs again of the existence of this harmony. And he has various ideas. I mean, some of them he's trying to fit in platonic ideas. In the Timaeus, we haven't mentioned, I don't think, this idea of the five platonic solids, the, the uh, tetrahedron, the cube, and so forth. He, he th speculates, oh, well, maybe between the... Uh, between Mercury, for example, and Venus, we can put one of these platonic solids. Between Venus and the Sun, we can put another platonic solid. And he, he, he finds that works quite well. That's in an earlier work, but then in, in the Harmonica is Mundi, he has... Uh, he comes up with uh, wonderful calculations. I won't try and mangle Kepler's third law. I'll leave it to either Jim or Angela. Well, Angela doesn't want to mangle anything, but she's, <laughs> wag she's wagging her finger at me or you, so here we go. 
Well, it's just that um, with Kepler, we find um, we come to a point where the two worlds split apart, the magical and the scientific. Yeah. And particularly interesting is the debate between Robert Flood, mm, yeah. the Renaissance hermeticist, mm. and Kepler, mm. which somehow epitomises this, this split that we've come to, this, this point of splitting, where for, for Flood, you know, the symbolic image is everything, the, the, the microcosm-macrocosm relationship, these wonderful complex diagrams showing proportional relationships between light and dark. It's a revelation, it's a, it's a visionary, imaginal, poetic, experience and he said that's the real mm. cosmic music that's the real this way we get into it yeah. Yeah. yes but he was also um, uh, you know, involved in esoteric philosophy and Kepler was the scientist and they argued vehemently about the, about the nature of um, so, what so was this true. is this is where we really Jim and we're coming to the end of the program yes. I'm sorry to brush you all but I'm sure right. this is where we begin to split apart yes I'm not sure that the split comes quite with Kepler, but mm. um, I mean, Kepler's where the story of astronomy really has something to say here, yeah, because yeah. because Kepler can can make the, this musical notation mean something in astronomy. He says that the angular uh, speed, the speed of the planet with respect to the sun, uh, um, uh, at furthest from the from the sun, planet moving slowest, closest to the sun moving fastest are all related in whole number ratios, in harmonic ratios, and he draws these out in musical notation. So he has a, he has a, he has a, 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 a music of the spheres in, in astronomical time, if you like. But the funny thing, the odd thing about Kepler for our project of the music of the spheres is that he has no spheres. Mm. So there, there are mm. only orbits. For, it's, it's finally with it's Kepler planetary. that you get the idea of planetary orbits, mm. which, which are related harmonically because God has a grand design, mm. and, and that can be expressed musically. And uh, but that also has a, a, has a, a, an astronomical system which can be used empirically. But from the from him from the late 16th century, the idea of the music of the spheres began to lose its potency. Indeed, and and although I wouldn't have called, for example, Flood an astronomer. I mean, Flood no. doesn't say no. anything that matters in astronomy a as, a, as a magician. Under, yes. Yeah. Uh, so although although he talks about the cosmos. Kepler talks about the cosmos, talks about music and so on, not, not as spheres, but he really matters in astronomy. By the time you get to Flood, no, there is nothing more to say to astronomers no, in relation to the harmony uh, of the spheres. Uh, someone who, who does try and still hold things together is the encyclopedist uh, Athanasius Kircher in the 17th century. He's read Flood, he's read Kepler, he's very interested in astronomy. But, and he responds to Galileo, for example, and tries to in integrate Galilean telescopic observations into his music of the spheres. He says, for example, Jupiter with its four satellites becomes one choir, one musical choir, and the sun has its equivalent four satellites uh, of, the, of the Earth, Moon, sun, um, Venus and Mercury. So he's really trying to hold on to this idea of the music while responding to new observations. Briefly, yes, well, just to point out that um, we do now have NASA spacecraft um, exploring planets and sending back vibrations, vibrationary patterns, which can be translated into music, and some mm. of them are extraordinarily mm. beautiful, strong rhythmic patterns. So and, it does. And we on. also have Gustav Holtz, but no more time. <laughs> so Peter Forshaw, Jim Bennett, Angela Vos, thank you very much. Next week, the Arab conquests of the 7th and 8th centuries. Thank you for listening. Mm -hmm. Phew. We hope you've enjoyed this Radio 4 podcast. You can find hundreds of other programmes about history, science and philosophy at bbc.co.uk forward slash Radio 4.